okay, you know, fine, I'll do this impossible thing, but you got to give me a wagon full of corn, you know, or you've got to go get my dress, you know, and things like that. It's like, oh, but hang on, I didn't tell you that actually I'm a sorcerer as well as a horse. Right. Oh, thank goodness for that. That's, that's the struggle of imagination that we're all engaged in, is how do we leap all together at once? Four storytellers and one story. I'm Jay Leeming, and this is the Crane Bag Podcast. Today we're going to explore the Russian story known as the Firebird. Explore it through the voices of four storytellers. Walton Stanley, Laura McClure, Catherine Heinemeyer, and myself. Thank you for joining me. Let us begin. This story happened long ago. In that time, things were different. That time was not like our time. In that time, there were kings and rulers and leaders who thought more of their own self-aggrandizement and their own desires than they thought of the welfare of their people. In that strange long ago time, there was a king who lived in the land beyond the thrice nine lands in the thrice tenth kingdom. And that king had in his retinue a huntsman, a huntsman who was brave and intrepid. And that huntsman had a horse who was valiant and wise. Now, one day it fell out that the huntsman was riding on his horse through the land, doing what huntsmen do. The huntsman was reading the land, was looking for the animal signs, looking for the tracks, looking for the places where the deer had bedded down, looking for how the water was flowing through the streams and where the animals had gone to take a drink, assembling all the knowledge and reading the land so that when the time came, he might know best how to hunt the game that was there. And while he was looking around in this way, reading the land, he saw something ahead of him on the trail, something glowing, gleaming like a fire burning on the trail. It was a single golden feather of the great and powerful firebird blazing ahead of him on the trail. And the huntman stopped his horse and he dismounted and he walked over and knelt down at that feather and examined it. And the huntsman was about to reach over and pick up that feather when his horse spoke to him. Yes, the horse spoke. The horse said, you should consider if you pick up that feather, you will know trouble and strife. And the huntsman paused, as we should, to consider. He paused, he considered, and he looked again at this marvelous, amazing object, a burning feather, a thing that looked so wild and free and crazy, and yet he could hold it in his hand. And once he'd held it in his hand, he had a strong desire to own it. The horse looked at him and said, I have warned you. And you know that I am a wise horse from many, many generations of wise horses. I am descended from the horses that led the great heroes of this nation to their victories in days gone past. And in days to come, I will be with them when they rise again and take over this land. So mark my words. The huntsman knew his horse to be wise, but he felt in his palm power such as he had not known before. He wanted it for himself, but he also wanted what it would give him access to within the power structures of his kingdom. He thought at once, I will take it to the king. I will give it to the king. The king wants everything for himself and he will reward me. He must certainly reward me greatly for this. The firebird, it's a fabled creature. No one has ever seen it before. We can see the effects that it has. We can see the, the havoc that it wrecks, but I've got its feather and I'm going to take that feather and give it to the king. So he picked up that feather from the path of the forest. He picked it up, he put it in the pocket of his jacket. And he got on his horse 
and he turned that horse around and he went through the wild, wild forest with the birds singing around him, the birds who were not in cages there, with the animals around him, the insects singing and humming in those trees, each doing, following the law of its own being. So he went through that forest and back to the castle. And his horse was taken off to the stable, and he himself went into this beautiful castle with gold and silver there, with statues and tapestries on the walls, many things that had been taken and become the possession of this king. And he was a king without a queen, it must be said. And so the hunter went through the halls of this castle and to the throne room, his steps echoing through those rooms. And he got to the throne room and he knelt down before the king there in his golden chair and he put the feather down on the ground. And he said, sire, today for you, I do not have one of the beasts of the field. I do not have a, a boar to, to grace the banquet table today, but something far greater. I have a single feather from the great fire bird itself, that bird of passion and energy, which runs riot through this world that we've heard so much about the magic fire bird itself. And the king looked down at the feather, the feather glowing there in its own way, as if it was alive, filled with the, the energy of fire and the wild poem that is things that burn. And the king looked at this and was pleased. And his eyes grew big and his heart sang in a certain avaricious way. And he said to himself, I love this feather. And he said to the hunter, you have done well, you have done well, but I can see you are good at finding and taking things. And this is not quite enough for me. There is more I desire for with this feather comes the entire bird. There is the bird out there. I want you to bring me the whole bird itself, the whole blaze of wild feathers that that creature is. You can do this. You must do this. In fact, I want you to return here within three days with the fire bird itself. If not, I will call the executioner and have your head cut from your shoulders and you will lie beneath this green earth and you will breathe the sweet air of this world no more. And the hunter said, yes, your majesty, I will do this. And with sadness in his heart, he turned and he walked from that throne room. And where did he go? Did he go to his house? Did he go to his bed? Did he go to the bar? No, he went to the stable with the smell of hay there, with the animals there, the horses there. He went to his own horse with its chocolate dark eyes and his beautiful coat there. He put his head down next to that horse for he was sad. And the horse spoke and said, why are you so sad? And the hunter explained how now the king wanted him to obtain the entire firebird or else he would be killed within three days. And the hunter said, do not sorrow over this. This is not trouble. Real trouble is still to come. What you must do is go to the king, get three bags of grain and then bring them here. And tomorrow early in the morning, the two of us will set out. So the hunter went to the king, he got three bags of grain, he brought them back to the horse, and then that night he slept. And in the morning he woke and the grain at his request had been scattered all over the fields. So the fields were thick with it and the smell and the dust of it flew up on the breeze and over the sky all the way to the land far beyond the ocean where the firebird slept. And the firebird slept alone. It was the last of its kind. There had been a time in the past when there had been more firebirds, but even the firebird itself could scarcely remember those times. So it sat alone in its nest and it felt the breezes wafting over the ocean and it smelt that dust of the corn and it took to its wings and it flew. And as it flew, the sky almost darkened. It was so big, except for its wings actually radiated a golden light themselves. And it landed eventually with a huge swooshing and the corn of the whole field was waving with the wind of its wings as it landed on the edge of that field and it started to graze. And the hunter, meanwhile, with his horse, had crept very slowly into the woods at the edge of that field, that boundary between the woods and the field where you can hear both the birds in the forest and the birds of the field all singing at once, except for now they were all silent. They'd all flown away at the arrival of the firebird. So there was complete silence for the hunter and his horse to watch the firebird as it grazed. And the hunter hid himself up in the high branches of an oak tree where foliage was so thick the firebird couldn't see him. 
but the horse started walking around the edge of the field. It circled the entire field at a great distance first. And the firebird looked up, but then continued with its grazing, put its head back down. And then the horse circled a little closer to the center of the field where the firebird was. Again, the firebird looked up, but saw the horse paying no attention to him and carried on with its grazing. And then a third time it circled, this time very close to the firebird until it was behind the firebird. And suddenly its hooves in an instant were on the firebird's wings, pinioning them down to the floor, to the soil. And the firebird looked up and it breathed fire at him in rage and sorrow, but it was too late. And the horse and the hunter managed to trap the firebird in a net and to bring it back to the throne room of the Tsar. And the Tsar was very pleased with the hunter, and he rewarded him with silver and gold. But now, being a king in possession of the great and powerful firebird, he thought that he deserved the most special queen in existence. And therefore, he gave the huntsman another task. He told the huntsman that he must travel beyond the thrice nine lands, beyond the thrice tenth kingdom, to the eastern edge of the world, where the red morning sun rises out of the dark blue sea, and there he must find the princess Vasilisa, and he must bring that princess back to be the queen of that land. And if he were to do this thing, he would be rewarded, but if he failed, well, then the sword of the executioner would pass between the huntsman's chin and his shoulders and his head would be forfeit. And so the huntsman again went to the stable to see his horse. And his horse instantly knew something was the matter, something was troubling the huntsman. And so he asked and the huntsman told him the whole story of what he'd been tasked with. And the horse said, did I not tell you, if you picked up that feather, you would know trouble and strife? But never mind that, for the trouble is not now, the trouble is yet to come. Here's what you must do. You must go to the king and you must tell him that you need for this trip, a pavilion, a tent with a golden cover, and that you also need food for a feast to entertain the princess and find rare foreign wine. And when you have attained these things, then we will leave on this trip to the Eastern lands. And so the huntsman did that very thing. He went to the king and he made this request and the king granted it. He provided him with a pavilion, a tent with a golden cover and with food of all kinds and fine foreign wines. And the huntsman and the horse set off for the eastern lands. They rode beyond the thrice nine lands, beyond the thrice tenth kingdom. They rode for a long time or a short time, as they say. But eventually they came to the eastern edge of the world where the red sun rises out of the blue sea. And there the huntsman let his horse loose to graze and find pasture. And he looked out on the sea and he saw a silver barge propelled by golden oars. It was the royal barge of the princess Vasilisa. And the huntsman erected his tent with the golden cover and set out his feast and the fine wines. And the princess from her barge looked to the land and she saw something gleaming in the sunlight. It was the golden tent cover. And she wanted to find out who was in that tent, so she ordered her ship to take her to the shore. And there she was met by the huntsman who offered her food and strong foreign wines, which she had not tasted before. And the huntsman kept her glass filled as she ate. And the princess Vasilisa soon fell into a deep and profound sleep. And the huntsman struck his tent and picked up the princess and laid her across the saddle of his valiant horse and began to ride westward back to his home country. They rode and they rode, laden down as they were with the tent and the princess and the weight of what they had done. 
and they rode all the way back to the thrice nine lands and the thrice tenth kingdom. Across the forests and the steppe and the mountains they rode. It took a long time or it took a short time, either way. They got back just at the moment when Princess Vasilisa's eyes opened. She heard bells ringing. She heard bells ringing in her head. She had pain she had never known before. She did not know where she was. She was shocked. She was angry. She was afraid. What are these bells? Why do bells ring? Why do bells ring inside my head and outside my head? Tell me, where is this place? And the huntsman said, do not fear, princess. I have brought you to a perfect place for you to be. The bells are ringing for your wedding day, for you will marry a king. That's what a princess wants, no? She looked around her and saw heading towards her a procession with the king who was to be her husband at the front, looking noble, looking proud, looking powerful, looking old, looking cruel, looking cold. And she thought, I want no part of this. But she had some wisdom despite a banging headache and she thought, I can't just walk away. I've got to think of some royal way of dealing with this problem. The king approached her and said, my dear, welcome to your new home. Welcome to your kingdom. She said, my lord, I'm overwhelmed by this experience. And I hear the bells ringing for a wedding for which I have no dress. Ah, said the king, that is no problem. We can have the most magnificent dress created for you. And he began to describe a garment so fantastic, but she wasn't listening. She said, no, I must be married in my wedding gown, which I have saved all these years for the purpose. But I left my home in such a rush, I did not have time to fetch it and bring it with me. What a shame. Now, a brave and valiant fellow came to fetch me from my home. He gave me many fine wines to drink. It was so kind of him. I'm sure he will not mind returning there and fetching that dress which I need in order to get married today. Ah, yes, indeed said the king. And he sent for the huntsman and said, you've got to go back. Leave here at once. Go back through the mountains and the steppe and the forests. Leave the thrice nine lands and the thrice tenth kingdom and go back to the edge of the world where the red sun sets into the blue sea. And there you must find the wedding dress of the princess Vasilisa. She said, yes, it lies beneath a rock in the middle of the sea. You can't miss it. Well, the huntsman again shed bitter tears and turned to his horse, who said, what did I tell you would happen if you picked up that feather? Ah, but never mind. This is not trouble. The trouble is to come. What we must do is head off straight away, back the way we have come. And so they did. So early the next morning, they set out riding in the direction of the rising sun, the bringer of new things. And that golden light filled the air and filled the branches of the trees as they rode through the forest towards the east. And they went over hills and they went through valleys and through swamps. They went a long way or a short time or a short time or a long time. And finally they came to the roaring, great whispering, laughing sound of the great ocean itself. And there was the ocean and there was the sand. And guided by his horse, he went along the shore until they found a grassy place. And there they hid in those grasses. And the horse said, wait here. We will wait for a short time and see what happens. And they waited and the wind blew and the seagulls cried in the air. And then out of the ocean, there came a great crab. Yes, a crab. He was pink. He was purple. He had green claws scuttling sideways out of the sea. He came onto the sand and the horse leapt out of those grasses and Pura brought his hooves down onto the shell of that crab. And he said, crab, crab, I have you now. I will crush your shell in less. And the crab said, mercy, mercy, mercy. 
And the horse said, unless you bring me the wedding dress of Vasilisa the Beautiful, a wedding dress that lies under a rock at the bottom of the sea. I know that dress, said the crab, and it's strange scuttling language. I will do this. I will do this. Now, horse, the horse said, I want you to swear. I want you to swear that you will do this. I'm not going to just let you go. You must swear to get this dress for me. I need this beautiful waterfall, amazing dress that is down there. And the crab said, I swear. I swear upon the mother of the sea herself. I will go down to the sea and I will retrieve this dress. And the horse lifted its hooves up and stepped away from the crab. And the crab called out in the crab language that clattering, whispering language that sounds like shells dumped onto a beach, perhaps, that sounds like wind blowing through dry branches, a clattering, clicking language. And soon, out of the sea, there came a hundred other crabs, all scuttling up sideways, and they gathered around the larger crab that had been there. And he spoke to them in the crab language. It sounded like wind blowing through a thousand needles and the, th the eyes of a thousand needles. And then they all went back into the sea and the sea bubbled and frothed and they went down to the bottom of that sea. And the hunter and the horse waited there on the sandy shore. And after a while, the sea bubbled and frothed again, like a great thing this way and that. And then out of that sea came all of the crabs and they were bearing on their backs this amazing dress a dress that seemed like a waterfall itself, that seemed to be made out of stars and perhaps out of the winter snows as well. And the tears shed thousands of years ago by grandmothers who did not know they would be in this story. And they brought that dress up onto the shore and the hunter and the horse thanked the crabs. And they took the dress and put it on the back of the horse. And the hunter got on that horse and turned around and began to gallop towards the west, towards the kingdom and towards the castle. And when Vasilis is standing on the battlements of the castle, looking out, trying to work out which direction was her home, where was her silver boat that she used to sail in, trying to smell the air, her heart sank when she saw, instead of any sign of her boat, the huntsman and his horse coming and bearing the unmistakable contours of her beautiful pearlescent dress. And as they came up to the castle, there was nothing for it. She had to go into the changing room with maids all around her, assisting her, fussing her, putting up her hair and helping her into this dress. And as each pearl button was fastened on the back of it, she felt her chest constricting. But her mind was racing the whole time. And when she came out of that changing room, her eyes went around the throne room and she saw the old Tsar who was to be her husband very soon. She saw all of the servants who were to be her servants very soon and her eyes fell on the young man who had brought her here. And she realized she had very few choices, options left. So she walked up to the Tsar and she whispered in his ear in her most charming voice, the voice that even young maidens who grow up all alone on the very edge of the world learn that it's a useful voice to have in your repertoire. And she said to him, I want penance. I want the man who brought me here to pay penance for what he has done to me. I want him to pay his penance in a vat of boiling water. So fetch your foresters, get them to build a fire high and fill the cauldron with water. And the Tsar ordered that this all be done. Well, the huntsman, he said, I will do it, but... But first of all, let me speak with my horse, with my horse of power. And he went, he, this was granted him and the horse was brought into the throne room and the horse whispered into his ear what he needed to do. And the horse said, well, perhaps trouble now has found you, but be of good cheer, said the horse, for I will cast a spell over you. I will say a charm in your ear that will protect you in the boiling cauldron. And the charm was whispered into the huntsman's ear by the horse from his horsey lips. And the huntsman felt oddly calm and walked right over and climbed in to the boiling cauldron. And he sat there as pleasantly as anyone might in a lovely tub. And he dunked his head 
under the boiling water and held his breath under there. He dunked his head a second time. And when he had dunked his head a third time, he rose up out of the cauldron and he'd been transformed. He was shining. He was the most beautiful man anyone had ever seen. And the king, jealous for this kind of beauty, immediately ran over and he himself jumped into the cauldron. But of course, no horse of power had whispered a charm over the king and he was scalded to death immediately. And so there was nothing else for it. The princess Vasilisa was in her wedding gown and here was the most beautiful man anyone had ever seen. And so the princess Vasilisa married the huntsman and they took over the kingdom and they ruled it happily and prosperously for many years. Now, you know, there was a moat around that castle and in that moat, there was a duck and that duck witnessed the whole story. She heard the whole tale told many times and that duck took the story and she dipped it with her bill into the water for many years and she passed it on to her children. And so the ducks carried the story, which gives the story its moist quality. But one year, one year, a sable, a sable black as night came and raided a duck's nest and it ate a duck egg. And the story went into the sable people, which gives the story its edge of darkness. And that sable carried it into its lair down in the earth. And so the story was kept by the sable people with their weasley wisdom. And it might have remained there, but one spring there were heavy, heavy rains and the sable's nest was flooded and the young sables were drowned and the story leached into the earth. And it would have remained in the earth, but one year a farmer came and he plowed up that field and he planted cabbages and the story was pulled up by the roots into the cabbages and it made the cabbages so delicious and so sweet that every year people wanted to plant more and more of that kind of cabbage. And at last that cabbage was planted all over the world and it ended up in some jars of kimchi. And Jay and Laura and Catherine and I happened to eat some of this kimchi and the story went into us and now we've told you. After we all told the story, we spent some time tossing it around a bit. I started out by asking everyone what part of the story grabbed them the most. And Catherine had this to say. Well, for me, um, it's that moment where he gets to the edge of the sea and needs the dress from the bottom of the sea. And being, you know, a, a biologist partly by training, I'm thinking that's the Mariana Trench, man. That's a long way down. And you definitely are not going to manage that by yourself. And it's the moment in the story when his reliance on the animals in the story is the most pronounced. And that and and um whoever was telling at that point, um I think it was uh, you, Walton, um, brought out how um, how he, all he could do was was demand that that the crab swore he would do it. You know, he had no further power at that stage. The crab went away, and yet somehow the crabs brought him what he needed. Um, that's a strong one for me. Hmm. He's kind of powerless. I, I realize in that moment, right? I mean, he makes the the crab swear, but but that's it's kind of out of his hands. He's just got to sit on the shore. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Um, somebody else? Well, for me, it's it's the moment of, of whether or not to pick up the feather is, is a key moment, you know, like, 
here's this thing, you find this thing and, and, uh, you know, you're, you're drawn to it. It's magical. It's powerful, obviously. And, you know, and then you you know, the animal sense and you says, if you pick that up, you're going to know trouble, you know? And of course it's, you know, it's kind of our job to, to know trouble, right. You know, the, the, you know, uh, good trouble, if you will. But, uh, but yeah, it's th just that moment of, well, do I dare? Is it, is it right? Do I pick, do I pick up the feather or not? You know, which of course drives the whole rest of the story. Yes. In a sense, that's the last choice he makes in the story, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Everything else is he's dependent on his horse sense a after that, literally. Yeah. And the horse character is great. I like that the horse is this voice of wisdom and reason. And, you know, you think, why isn't the horse the protagonist? He's, he's got much better ideas about what to do. And you, you want him to get sorted out at the end, don't you? You want him to marry a princess. <laughs> I, I think it's important, too, that the, the huntsman knows enough to let the horse give the for, horse free rein. You know, he lets the horse kind of go. And then the horse obviously, you know, pins the firebird the, because he's free. He's not tied to a tree someplace or something. He pins the crab down and, you know, so, and, you know, uh, 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 negotiates the, the bargain with the crab. So, it's yeah, it's the horse that's really doing all the work, but it's because the horse has been freed that he's allowed, to, he's able to do it. Yeah, that's important, isn't it? Yeah, the, the yeah the horse has has the agency, if you like. Yeah, the horse is the is the one who knows things. Mm -hmm. And he frees the horse when Walton when he sort of just just well, you know, at, at various places, like so he he's kind of frees the horse. Well, when you know after they've cast the corn out on the field and they're waiting for the firebird, the horse is just out on his own, right? Yeah. And and then later at the at the beach, you know, he's standing there as Catherine said, you know, contemplating the impossibility of this task, you know, to to find the one rock at the very bottom of the Marianas Trench under which this you know and how do you get there mm -hmm. and so you know sitting at the edge of the sea uh, you know contemplating the impossibility of the situation and you know because the horse is wandering around free it's able to stop you know to capture the crab with its hoof and, yeah mm -hmm. in some ways the whole story like who's uh free in the story and who's not you know and in some ways the hunter as soon as he picks up that feather he's sort of not free in a way because as soon as the king has it and the king, in a sort of a Buddhist sense, is not free because he's under his desire. He's just constantly. And then the horse is kind of free. The crab is kind of like gets into this, is forced to do a deal. And then Vasilisa herself is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is not she free or not? I mean, she's free on the ocean, that beautiful image of her way out there. But then she gets caught and, you know, abducted, dragged away. Now, I didn't get a chance to say what attracts me about the story. I would I would say not to be boring, but I would also say the feather. Um, this that burning feather in the green forest, that element of fire there in a region which is filled with growing things. There's something just really great about it. Um, but that's just sort of a footnote because I want to follow the train of thought here. The things we don't like about this story. So we didn't write this story, dear listeners. None of us made this up. Uh, it came uh, through the voices of uh, many people uh, written down in the 19th century in Russia. Um, and who knows how long it was carried before then, potentially thousands of years. There's some fairy tales that are upwards of six or 7,000 years, as far as we know. Um, so this could be one of those. And so generations of people carried the story in this way and told it in this way. And if they changed it, it wasn't, uh, you know, the changes have led to this. So for me personally, I was just going to, I was going to say, and I was going to ask all of us, what's a moment we argue with in this story or wrestle with and for me it's vasilisa there getting just dragged away you know everything's so lovely and romantic we're by the sea we've got a tent there's some wine she's in a boat and and then all of a sudden it's like you're coming with me it's like he not only is he dragging her away but he's also sort of um any desire he might have is subordinated to the king's desire and his uh his connection to the king you know because uh, he 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 could, of course, drag her off to his own house and leave the kingdom. That would be one equally bad from Vasilisa's point of view point, uh, way to go. But nevertheless, he, he subsumes his own desire uh, just to take it to the king and obey orders from command central. Any insight into that moment, anybody? Well, I think with Vasilisa, she's within a structure, isn't she? 
she knows she's within a structure. She's called a princess, you know, she's been dragged to the throne room of a king. She knows she can't walk away, which is why she has to be crafty and brings in the magic item with the dress. So I like yes. that, that she's, you know, she knows the bureaucracy cannot be fought. You know, <laughs> It's there, but she's got a way around it. And in one of the versions that I've read, she puts something in the cauldron. And it says or her hand rising above the cauldron is actually that's a decision she makes to that there might be something in the power of her hand moving over the steam to save him rather than any any word from the horse. Wow, mm. that's great. I love that. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, that's women's she... agency, isn't it? In stories, women's agency is within rules. And the quicker you work them out and the quicker you read the room and decide how to act to save yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's often in these in these kind of stories from patriarchal mm -hmm. worlds that's yeah. that's people that's women passing on wisdom to each other quick you okay so you've lived your whole life beyond the ocean sailing around in a blissful silver boat but you really quickly need to understand the situation here <laughs> and and adapt yeah it's also that 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 mood of going from the sea which is powerful and changeable and going to the land in some kind of poetic way that what you're saying, Catherine, rings true to me. You know, she's in the world of rules and stone walls and stuff, you know. Um, and the hunter, he does, he takes action, but once he picks up that feather, he doesn't have much choice really besides talking to his horse, you know. But then she chooses him to marry him, you know, which is kind of a sudden thing. Well, she does, but it's, but it's after she cooks him. You know, she has him cooked, which, you know, to me, you know, it's like, yeah, she's she's tricked and she he gets her drunk and she falls asleep and off off they go. But, you know, she's also essentially like the, the goddess of the sea. Right. I mean, she's enormously powerful. And so, you know, these little these little human tricks are 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 not a, a big thing for her in some ways. So, uh, yeah, so she has him cooked alive. Uh, which, in a sense, is 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 exactly, of course, what's needed, you know, because it it cooks off any ugliness in him, and he emerges shining and beautiful mm -hmm. because of the charm. Whether it's the charm from the horse or the charm from her, which, interestingly, being the goddess of the sea and the connection of horses and sea, they might be, in a sense, one and the same, right? But um, but it also uh, it also kills the greedy self. It kills the king. Mm -hmm. uh, and replaces the king with a, a shining and beautiful uh, a male force rather than the, you know, yeah. the avaricious old czar there. But so, yeah, that transfer, that fiery transformation mm. you know, is again, you know, the, the transformational power of fire that's in the firebird, that's in the cauldron, that's, yeah. That's and the connection with the, the cauldron and the water and her and the sea and the, the fire and the sea have been mm -hmm. brought together to transform him. And yeah, again, so you've got a sort of ritual cleansing happening there. Yeah. And, you know, conveniently, she's creating her own perfect husband, given that, you know, there has to be a husband. We're in that structure. You're wearing the dress. You've done up all the buttons. Might as well be the most beautiful man anyone's ever seen, right? <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> Might as well. And again, we can think of this story in the world, of course, and then we can think of it as like happening in a psyche, like inside a personality of a person. And, and the, so the dance between the genders is interesting. And then the, the fire and the water thing is interesting because we start with fire with the bird and we capture that fire and then we end up at the water and the ocean. And then the conclusion is this marriage of those two elements, right? Like the fire makes the water boil, you know, so the two elements are combined in a very spectacular sort of way. So I just find something very elegant in that. It's like a dance somehow, you know. And is there some some way in which Vasilisa and the Firebird are deeply connected? Because otherwise we hear nothing further about the Firebird in the story. The Firebird is the catalyst for the seizing of Vasilisa. So I don't, I, I'd love to know more about that connection between yeah, her and- Where does the Firebird go? Is it is it now the sort of court pet? <laughs> or you know what happens to it? it's the last one Catherine I know it is oh that was great the last one oh my yeah, god yeah I love yeah. that bit 
Well, I was thinking about a, a true story I just read recently about a small island in the Orkney Islands, Papa Westray, where I've been twice. And there is a statue there of the very last little orc. And it's in a place you have to really scramble to find a little red statue just a foot tall of the last little orc, which is sort of a, a puffin like bird. Um, and that the, the last one, the last one of its kind was a known bird to the people of Papa Westray. And the landlord, the absentee landlord of that island was in correspondence with a man who kept a museum, I think somewhere in Glasgow. And this uh, man in the museum asked him to hunt, to kill and send him the very last one of the little ox for his collection. And he forced, the, the, the landlord forced several local men to go out and capture this little orc and it put up a massive fight and they had to, you know, one of them, one of the men nearly lost his life in the in the attempt to capture this bird and by the time they managed to catch it, it, its body was quite mangled, it wasn't even a good specimen anymore, but the museum owner got his uh, bird and the laird got his points, you know, he, he curried favour with it and that just reminded me of it so, so much, you know, that chain of compulsion. Mm. Once, once somebody's wishes, somebody's whim dictates that this needs to happen. Everybody else is just forced down those tram lines. Mm. Did you say a red auk as well? It isn't red, but the statue for some reason is red. Maybe just so that you can see it. It just sits on a little ledge um, in the cliff on the north tip of the island. Wow, wow. I'm reminded of California, where a grizzly bear is on the flag, uh, the last of the state. Uh, and the last grizzly bear was killed in 1922, I believe it is, the last uh, grizzly bear in California, um, which was a genetically distinct species from the ones in Montana, apparently. Um, so, but it's on the flag, you know, as often you kill the animal and you parade its pelt around. So, so if I had to imagine the end of this story in that way, I would imagine two things, either a flag of the kingdom with a firebird on it, even though the firebird's in a cage, or I like to imagine the uh, hunter and Vasilisa going to the garden after the feast from the wedding and opening the door to the iron cage and letting the firebird out. Um, yeah, when it comes out of the cage, there's a clutch of flaming golden eggs. <laughs> That's it's reproduced that. all by itself. Wow. I like that. <laughs> You know, to me, there's a there's kind of a useful little life lesson. I mean, many of them, but one specifically is that, um, you know, what what the horse and 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 the princess Vasilisa both do is when something's you know sort of put upon them, uh, they come up with a, a counter demand, some kind of counter demand, you know, and that's actually I think that is kind of a, a life skill when when people are trying to you know lay things on you or lay power over you to to be sure that even if it's inconsequential demand something back you know uh, I, okay you know fine I'll do this impossible thing but you got to give me a wagon full of corn you know or you've got to go get my dress you know and, and things like that so it's it it's a it's just a, a funny little thing but both of them use that and it's a it's a way I think in the psyche to to deflect and kind of do an Aikido move on, on dangerous energies. Yeah, a bit of bargaining. Yeah. yeah. I like the idea of the temptation of the flaming feather because it's at once really desirable and kind of palpably dangerous. You know, you can see that it's a burning thing that shouldn't be burning, you know? Why is the forest not alight? But yet you want to hold it in your hand and that's what wins in the end. Yeah, I think um, for me, it's the the way the story forces you to think about where where are your actual choice points? Where can you get off certain rails and onto other rails? And how much does that depend on other people? I think mostly in the story, it almost entirely depends on other people. It would always require a concerted effort and, yeah, you know, within the environmental movement, the climate movement, I'm involved in that's that's the struggle of imagination that we're all engaged in is you know how could this look different and how would we get there mm. how do we make this leap it doesn't feel like there's any place you can get off these tram lines how do we leap all together at once and you know you can see a couple of places in the story where that could happen it sort of it, it forces you to think of those mm. like many stories it's an education in in 
dancing and wrestling with the limits around us, I guess. It doesn't just start with a blank page and dream up anything you want, you know, and then pink rabbits showed up with watermelon and everything was fine. Uh, it's not a Disney theme park ride like that. Uh, so it, it deals with those harsh energies, which I, which is something I love about a story like this. The sort of the magic horse thing is a little bit, you know, it's almost too convenient, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's yeah. like, oh, but hang on, I didn't tell you that actually I'm a sorcerer as well as a horse. Right. Oh, thank goodness for that. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Just Been to, riding you all these years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't know. Just to spell it out, yeah, the version I heard, he he um leaps into the cauldron. And so the magic works because he leaps, and the king doesn't right. leap, and so is boiled alive, you know. Okay. I mean, there's something, I mean, there's, that's got loads of, of echoes in, in saints' tales, hasn't it? Mm. Leaping through fire, and, you know, getting boiled and all that. Well, think... there's an old uh, Celtic ritual, and it's actually a, a ritual in India, too, around a horse sacrifice, where, uh -huh. uh, where the king sort of mates with a horse, if you will, um, and, then, uh, and then the horse is sacrificed and made into a soup and the king gets into the cauldron and like eats the horse flesh in this cauldron of soup and then everybody comes and eats from the cauldron that the king has been bathing in wow the king survives that's, he does not that's survive. got it all they, hasn't yeah it? They, they, they don't boil the king alive they they, they kill the horse but it's uh oh. it's it's like it's kind of like uh wedding the horse goddess or or, or wedding with uh, you know rian and it's kind of definitely thing. worse for the horse that that, that <laughs> worse situation. For the horse, yeah in in india they let a horse loose for like a year and then there's like a thousand young warriors and another thousand of another cast and they just follow the horse wherever it goes and wherever the horse goes becomes the new boundary of the kingdom when there's like a new king. So, and then the, you know, the warriors are there to enforce that. Like this is now the boundary, wherever this wild horse goes. Uh, oh, brilliant. Well, thank you all for telling this story and may we meet again soon. Goodbye, right. everybody. Goodbye, Cheers, my dear. Bye-bye, love. Bye. You See you soon. Bye. 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 Do we live in a world of separation or of connection? Both science and spirituality insist that we live in a world in which all things are connected. But it seems that whether we choose to see that or not is up to us. While I was telling this story, with my friends Lara, Walton, and Catherine. There was a man in my basement banging on some pipes because my water heater broke a few days before and was leaking water onto the basement floor. So while I was up here speaking into a microphone with these three other people and talking about fire and about water, in my basement there was a man wrestling with the pipes, a man making sure that the natural gas which comes from the earth burns in the right way and heats up the water in the great tank there, the water which, where I live, comes from the lake, Cayuga Lake. So these two things can be in harmony. He labored down there so we could have hot water and turn on the tap and find the water hot to our hands. When this story was over, I went downstairs and wrote the man a check. So the world of earth and air, fire and water, enters the story. And so that story goes out into the world. I'm Jay Leeming, and this is the Crane Bag Podcast. You can find more stories on my website, which is jayleeming.com, J-A-Y-L-E-E-M-I-N-G.com. And if you're able to support this podcast, please do. Uh, that keeps it going, keeps these stories journeying out into the world. A good way to do that is through Patreon. You can find that link on my website. Take care. And may we all know the wild beauty of the firebird and also the cool blue wisdom of the sea. <laughs>